Letter 70, on the proper time to slip the cable. After a long space of time, I have seen your beloved Pompeii. I was thus brought again face to face with the days of my youth, and it seemed to me that I could still do, nay, had only done a short time ago, all the things which I did there when a young man. We have sailed past life, Lucilius, as if we were on a voyage, and just as when at sea, to quote from our poet Virgil, lands and towns are left astern. Even so, on this journey, where time flies with the greatest speed, we put below the horizon first our boyhood and then our youth, and then the space which lies between young manhood and middle age and borders on both, and next the best years of old age itself. Last of all, we begin to sight the general born of the race of man. Fools that we are, we believe this born to be a dangerous reef, but it is the harbor where we must some day put in, which we may never refuse to enter. And if a man has reached this harbor in his early years, he has no more right to complain than a sailor who has made a quick voyage. For some sailors, as you know, are tricked and held back by sluggish winds, and grow weary and sick of the slow-moving calm, while others are carried quickly home by steady gales. You may consider that the same thing happens to us. Life has carried some men with the greatest rapidity to the harbor, the harbor they were bound to reach even if they tarried on the way, while others it has fretted and harassed. To such a life, as you are aware, one should not always cling, for mere living is not a good, but living well. Accordingly, the wise man will live as long as he ought, not as long as he can. He will mark in what place, with whom, and how he is to conduct his existence, and what he is about to do. He always reflects concerning the quality, and not the quantity, of his life. As soon as there are many events in his life that give him trouble and disturb his peace of mind, he sets himself free. And this privilege is his, not only when the crisis is upon him, but as soon as fortune seems to be playing him false. Then he looks about carefully and sees whether he ought or ought not to end his life on that account. He holds that it makes no difference to him whether his taking off be natural or self-inflicted, whether it comes later or earlier. He does not regard it with fear, as if it were a great loss, for no man can lose very much when but a driblet remains. It is not a question of dying earlier or later, but of dying well or ill. And dying well means escape from the danger of living ill. That is why I regard the words of the well-known Rhodian as most unmanly. This person was thrown into a cage by his tyrant, and fed there like some wild animal. And when a certain man advised him to end his life by fasting, he replied, A man may hope for anything while he has life. This may be true, but life is not to be purchased at any price. No matter how great or how well assured certain rewards may be, I shall not strive to attain them at the price of a shameful confession of weakness. Shall I reflect that fortune has all power over one who lives, rather than reflect that she has no power over one who knows how to die? There are times, nevertheless, when a man, even though certain death impends and he knows that torture is in store for him, will refrain from lending a hand to his own punishment. To himself, however, he would lend a hand. It is folly to die through fear of dying. The executioner is upon you. Wait for him. Why anticipate him? Why assume the management of a cruel task that belongs to another? Do you grudge your executioner his privilege, or do you merely relieve him of his task? Socrates might have ended his life by fasting. He might have died by starvation rather than by poison. But instead of this, he spent thirty days in prison awaiting death, not with the idea everything may happen, or... So long an interval has room for many a hope, but in order that he might show himself submissive to the laws and make the last moments of Socrates an edification to his friends, what would have been more foolish than to scorn death and yet fear poison? Scribonia, a woman of the stern old type, was an aunt of Drusus Libo. This young man was as stupid as he was well born, with higher ambitions than anyone could have been expected to entertain in that epoch, or a man like himself in any epoch at all. When Lebo had been carried away ill from the Senate House in his litter, though certainly with a very scanty train of followers, for all his kinsfolk undutifully deserted him when he was no longer a criminal but a corpse, he began to consider whether he should commit suicide or await death. Scribonius said to him, What pleasure do you find in doing another man's work? But he did not follow her advice. He laid violent hands upon himself. And he was right, after all. For when a man is doomed to die in two or three days at his enemy's pleasure, he is really doing another man's work if he continues to live. No general statement can be made, therefore, with regard to the question whether, when a power beyond our control threatens us with death, 
we should anticipate death or await it, for there are many arguments to pull us in either direction. If one death is accompanied by torture and the other is simple and easy, why not snatch the latter? Just as I shall select my ship when I am about to go on a voyage, or my house when I propose to take a residence, so I shall choose my death when I am about to depart from life. Moreover, just as a long, drawn-out life does not necessarily mean a better one, so a long, drawn-out death necessarily means a worse one. There is no occasion when the soul should be humored more than at the moment of death. Let the soul depart as it feels itself impelled to go, whether it seeks the sword or the halter or some draft that attacks the veins, let it proceed and burst the bonds of its slavery. Every man ought to make his life acceptable to others besides himself, but his death to himself alone. The best form of death is the one we like. Men are foolish who reflect thus. One person will say that my conduct was not brave enough, another that I was too headstrong, a third that a particular kind of death would have betokened more spirit. What you should really reflect is, I have under consideration a purpose with which the talk of men has no concern. Your sole aim should be to escape from fortune as speedily as possible. Otherwise, there will be no lack of persons who will think ill of what you have done. You can find men who have gone so far as to profess wisdom and yet maintain that one should not offer violence to one's own life, and hold it accursed for a man to be the means of his own destruction. We should wait, say they, for the end decreed by nature. But one who says this does not see that he is shutting off the path to freedom. The best thing which eternal law ever ordained was that it allowed to us one entrance into life but many exits. Must I await the cruelty either of disease or of man when I can depart through the midst of torture and shake off my troubles? This is the one reason why we cannot complain of life. It keeps no one against his will. Humanity is well suited because no man is unhappy except by his own fault. Live if you so desire. If not, you may return to the place whence you came. You have often been cupped in order to relieve headaches. You have had veins cut for the purpose of reducing your weight. If you would pierce your heart, a gaping wound is not necessary. A lancet will open the way to that great freedom, and tranquility can be purchased at the cost of a pinprick. What then is it which makes us lazy and sluggish? None of us reflects that some day he must depart from this house of life. Just so old tenants are kept from moving by fondness of a particular place and by custom, even in spite of ill-treatment. Would you be free from the restraint of your body? Live in it as if you were about to leave it. Keep thinking of the fact that some day you will be deprived of this tenure. Then you will be more brave against the necessity of departing. But how will a man take thought of his own end if he craves all things without end? And yet there is nothing so essential for us to consider. For our training in other things is perhaps superfluous. Our souls have been made ready to meet poverty, but our riches have held out. We have armed ourselves to scorn pain but we have had the good fortune to possess sound and healthy bodies, and so have never been forced to put this virtue to the test. We have taught ourselves to endure bravely the loss of those we love, but fortune has preserved to us all whom we loved. It is in this one matter only that the day will come which will require us to test our training. You need not think that none but great men have had the strength to burst the bonds of human servitude. You need not believe that this cannot be done except by a Cato, Cato, who with his hand dragged forth the spirit which he had not succeeded in freeing by the sword. Nay, men of the meanest lot in life had by a mighty impulse escaped to safety, and when they were not allowed to die at their own convenience, or to suit themselves in their choice of the instruments of death, they have snatched up whatever was lying ready at hand, and by sheer strength have turned objects which were by nature harmless into weapons of their own. For example, there was lately in a training school for wild beast gladiators a German, who was making ready for the morning exhibition. He withdrew in order to relieve himself, the only thing which he was allowed to do in secret and without the presence of a guard. While so engaged, he seized the stick of wood, tipped with a sponge, which was devoted to the vilest uses, and stuffed it, just as it was, down his throat. Thus he blocked up his windpipe and choked the breath from his body. That was truly to insult death. Yes, indeed. It was not a very elegant or becoming way to die, but what is more foolish than to be over nice about dying? What a brave fellow! He surely deserved to be allowed to choose his fate. How bravely he would have wielded a sword! With what courage he would have hurled himself into the depths of the sea or down a precipice! Cut off from resources on every hand, he yet found a way to furnish himself with death, and with a weapon for death. Hence you can understand that nothing but the will need postpone death. 
Let each man judge the deed of this most zealous fellow as he likes, provided we agree on this point, that the foulest death is preferable to the fairest slavery. Inasmuch as I began with an illustration taken from humble life, I shall keep on with that sort, for men will make greater demands upon themselves if they see that death can be despised even by the most despised class of men. The Catos, the Scipios, and the others whose names we are wont to hear with admiration we regard as beyond the sphere of imitation. But I shall now prove to you that the virtue of which I speak is found as frequently in the gladiator's training school as among the leaders in a civil war. Lately a gladiator, who had been sent forth to the morning exhibition, was being conveyed in a cart along with the other prisoners. Nodding as if he were heavy with sleep, he let his head fall over so far that it was caught in the spokes. Then he kept his body in position long enough to break his neck by the revolution of the wheel. So he made his escape by means of the very wagon which was carrying him to his punishment. When a man desires to burst forth and take his departure, nothing stands in his way. It is an open space in which nature guards us. When our plight is such as to permit it, we may look about us for an easy exit. If you have many opportunities ready to hand, by means of which you may liberate yourself, you may make a selection and think over the best way of gaining freedom. But if a chance is hard to find, instead of the best, snatch the next best, even though it be something unheard of, something new. If you do not lack the courage, you will not lack the cleverness to die. See how even the lowest class of slave, when suffering goads him on, is aroused and discovers a way to deceive even the most watchful guards. He is truly great, who not only has given himself the order to die, but has also found the means. I have promised you, however, some more illustrations drawn from the same games. During the second event, in a sham sea-fight, one of the barbarians sank deep into his own throat a spear which had been given him for use against his foe. Why, oh why, he said, have I not long ago escaped from all this torture and all this mockery? Why should I be armed and yet wait for death to come? This exhibition was all the more striking because of the lesson men learn from it that dying is more honorable than killing. What then? If such a spirit is possessed by abandoned and dangerous men, shall it not be possessed also by those who have trained themselves to meet such contingencies by long meditation, and by reason the mistress of all things? It is reason which teaches us that fate has various ways of approach, but the same end, and that it makes no difference at what point the inevitable event begins. Reason, too, advises us to die, if we may, according to our taste. If this cannot be, she advises us to die according to our ability, and to seize upon whatever means shall offer itself for doing violence to ourselves. It is criminal to live by robbery, but, on the other hand, it is most noble to die by robbery. Farewell.